Hello, and welcome to the Gravel Ride Podcast, where we go deep on the sport of gravel cycling through in-depth interviews with product designers, event organizers, and athletes who are pioneering the sport. I'm your host, Craig Dalton, a lifelong cyclist who discovered gravel cycling back in 2016 and made all the mistakes you don't need to make. I approach each episode as a beginner to unlock all the knowledge you need to become a great gravel cyclist. This week on the podcast, we've got part two of my discussion with James Gracie and his Perry Breast Paris ride in 2023. If you haven't listened to the episode last week, press stop, or pause, go back and listen to that episode because we're going to catch up with it halfway through. James is about 600 kilometers into Perry Brest Paris, a 1200 kilometer ride from Paris to the town of Brest in France back to Paris. Let's jump right in midstream to my conversation with James Gracie. So the way out to Brest is your first 600 kilometers. Mm-hmm. And this is a distance that you've now done pre once previously. Once before. Yeah. So you're, I'm a, I'm, this is all you're ready to go. So <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> did you, did you sleep at all on the first 600 K? I, I slept, uh, Lodiac is the, is the 400 K point. It's also yeah. where the bag drop point was. Okay. And so unfortunately, one of the gentlemen that is responsible for San Francisco randonneurs, he's, he runs the organization. Uh, and I think he's affiliated also with Rusa. Uh, he got sick. And so he's coming over to do the ride. He has gone way out of his way to make sure everybody has what they, we took 106 people from San Francisco, which is a huge contingent, bigger than most other countries are bringing and uh he his name is rob hawks and he got sick uh like to the hospital in the emergency room sick when he landed and so he had uh he had some hotel rooms in lodiac that he was when he realized he's not going to be able to to utilize them it was two days before and i was sick and so i was up at two in the morning being sick and i got a noticed that these hotel rooms were available so because i was sick i was like i'm done i'll take i'll take them both they were both in lodiac the first night and then the second night coming back and so i did grab all my gear my drop bag go to the hotel took a shower and uh lay down for like two hours and were you so were you was it going to work the math going to work out that you were going to be in the same hotel the mm-hmm. next night. Yeah. I just left my gear. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. So it saved me a little bit of time. So I didn't have yeah. to go check in to get gear. Yeah. It, it didn't work out quite that way because I was so far behind when I returned to Lodiac. Yeah. I had to go to the hotel, get my gear packet, n- no shower. I changed kits and went, uh, and had to go back and drop the bag cause they're leaving. Oh, the to bag get, drop people are leaving. That's how close we are. And that's one of the bigger problems with starting at the end that when yeah. it's at the end, if you had started at the beginning and you wrote, you fall six hours behind, no big deal. There are people that are yeah. you know, 12 and 13 hours behind you still. But when you start at the end and you get hours behind, you're at the end Yeah, and they are closing down the, the control stations. What was you your what was your kit set up like? It sounds like you brought two two sets of. Kit. I had three. I had one for one for each day, and I planned on I planned on changing them, and uh, they were just my regular road ride yeah. kits. Yeah, right? but just for like general cleanliness and. Yeah, you want to get out. You want to get for, out of that, and yeah. um, like I was in my my second kit for forty hours or something like that, um, coming coming back and. It, yeah. Feels pretty gross. So if you're back in, what was the town called? Lodiac. 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 Yeah. You're now have done 800 800K. 800K. So you got 400K to go. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, I got a message from you that made it sound like you're done. I'm done. Yeah. Uh, after after uh, Brest, it was kind of evening, beautiful sunset, and we're leaving Brest. And I'd been sick. I got sick the Friday before the ride, probably because we were just out having oysters and lots of seafood and lots of pate and lots of stuff that I just didn't agree with, um, or didn't agree with me. And so I was sick Friday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, before the event. And I just can't keep anything, anything that comes in that I put in comes right back out. And, uh, then that continued for the first day. Anybody I'd ride with, I would get in a groove riding with them on the first day, like with two or three people. And, 
I might ride with them for 45 minutes or an hour. And then I would say, I have to go. Like I got to go be, <laughs> I have to go be sick. And I would let him go, which stunk. Oh. And it kind of kept getting worse and worse. And I'm trying to eat and drink as much as I can, especially fluids. And uh, after breast, there is this, there are two secret controls. You don't know where the control is and it's to keep people from cheating. My thought was probably like yours is now, why would you do that? Why would you sign up for this self-inflicted thing and cheat? Apparently it happens. I don't know why you would do that. Just do the ride. So in this, in the second control, the secret control, I had had a fever and I I can't keep anything in me and I'm super dehydrated. And I even took pictures of like this dehydration that you can see in my face along the way. Uh, and I'd probably lost 10 or 12 pounds by that point is my guess from the Friday before I went to the secret control. I got to that point where I tried to think about, you know, a month ago and two months ago of what are you going to do when you have all the reasons in the world to quit? Like, are you going to push through and what are you willing to trade off for that, for the, at that time? And I, I knew the answer. But I capitulated, <laughs> and I uh, and I I went to the secret control. Um, when I had a fever, I was like, my wife had just texted me that the kids had COVID. And I was like, oh, I got COVID. That's where the fever's coming from. And because uh, we had just seen each other two days before, and I was like, this is you know I have children. I have to get back. I do not need to be in a French hospital for a month because I, you know, tried to tough it out. And so I went to the control. Uh, uh, officials and I said I need to withdraw, and uh, I was really concerned about the fever. and And he said, he said, okay, what's your number? And I gave him my number, and he said, all right, you would, you're, we're, we're going to withdraw you. And I said, what do I do? And he said, you ride to the next control. <laughs> you ride to the next <laughs> control. And I was like, I was like, can I sleep? I I was really tired. I said, can I sleep here? And he said, no, we're closing. The other problem with being at the very back, he said, we're closing in an hour. You cannot sleep here, and you cannot stay here. Because when we lock the doors, you cannot be here. I was like, well, the next control is car hay. It's 50 or 60 miles away. I was like, so if I quit, I still have to <laughs> ride. <laughs> this is at 10 or 11 at night. And he said, yes, that's what you do. And I said, well, take my name off the, <laughs> take my name off the list. <laughs> I rescinded my quit. Decide, <laughs> I'll decide when I get there if, uh, if there were, that's still the case. Because I am close and I just couldn't I couldn't overcome thinking like what I'm risking and I just drank and drank and drank and I think I I think I didn't have a fever I think I had I was hot because I didn't have anything to cool me off yeah because I was just super dehydrated and so I kept drinking and drinking and drinking and then by the time I got there uh to car hay I laid down and I, I think I sent you the video of like all the people laid out all over the place yeah, it's pretty amazing. Just like people just... It's unbelievable. Falling asleep with their head next to their food on the table. Anything, anywhere. Laying on the ground. Anywhere. Wearing their helmets. Yeah. Everything. They had... There were... I didn't see... I saw one person with their feet in the street, like on a highway. Like their feet are over the line. And you're like, wow. So you go and you move your feet. Somebody told me they saw a head over the... Head with helmet over the line like they just got over as far as they could go and they kind of fell over and went to bed <laughs> and so i got to car hay and i laid down in the cafeteria on the ground with flies everywhere and for two hours and i woke up and i felt a lot better i'd had a, yeah. i'd had a meal i'd had a lot of fluid and I, I was like at that point you know my plan was i don't have to don't think about what how far you have to go don't think i've got another 400 miles or whatever it was you think I just got to get to the next control. And then from that point forward, it's, I just have to get to the next control, whether it's 70 miles or a hundred miles. Yeah. Right. I just have to, if I can just get there and then I'll make a decision. Yeah. So and, you're, as you said before, you started in the tail end group, mm -hmm. presumably everybody around you, you're starting to see like the really back of the bus. We're seeing the back of, of even the people that left 12 hours before yeah. me are now back with us. Yeah. So and I'm, they're in a terrible, they're in a yeah. bad way. So are you, are you riding with some of these guys and girls? I'm riding, with, I'm riding with some of them. And we had, uh, I mean, some pretty interesting <laughs> ride baits for a while. <laughs> uh, that I'll, 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 I wish them all, I wish them all well. I did get told at one point I had been riding with this one, 
uh, Randonneur that I was kept riding in front of him and he won't get on my wheel. I'm like 40 feet in front of him, 30, 40 feet. I mean, he's getting zero benefit, but he, we're, he's matching my pace. I'm like if you want to get the benefit out of this, you have to ride like right behind me. I don't know how it is where you ride, but that's what you have to do. Or you may as well just ride by yourself because I'm also having to talk loudly so you can hear it way back there. And so this went on for seven or eight hours. I mean, long time, a long ride. And at one point I got, and this, we went back and forth and back and forth. We'd kind of split up and then come back together somehow, or I'd see him somewhere else. And at one point we're about to drop down into a, into a um, control. And I see, I see on my Garmin that we're about to descend for a, a bit, even if it's two or 300 feet, I don't want to come back up it. If there's no food there, because it's closed, then I got to come back up because yeah. there's a McDonald's, right? Because you're already feeling like you're on the bubble of maybe not I'm on needing the, I'm these on every control. I'm like, I don't know how this is going to work out. But yeah. it was getting better and better. And I was like, I told the group, I said, I'm going to that McDonald's. And I haven't had McDonald's in a dozen years. Easy. Because I quit. <laughs> And, and they, they realized pro- fast food is bad for you. <laughs> they were probably all like, oh, Americans, they all eat McDonald's. They all eat McDonald's. The draw of the Golden Arches yeah, was too it, much It was for too much. Well, I saw people in there, and it's just across the highway. So I went over there, and I got a Big Mac and fries and a Coke. It was amazing. <laughs> and I sat down, and then uh, a Japanese man came in. next. I said, you guys go ahead. I'm going to eat. I need to eat, and I don't want to have to come back up this hill to a closed McDonald's, maybe. Like, I would be devastated. It would be yeah. the end. And uh, then a Japanese man came in and sat. Uh, he, he couldn't figure out the self kiosk. So I walked him through it. And then while he was waiting on his order, I said, come down and sit next to me. He didn't speak any English. He spoke a little bit. And uh, he took his helmet off. And he, as soon as he sat down, he burst into tears. And wow. I said, I said, it's all right, man. Like, I'm in, the, I'm in the same place. I'm just not crying. And I don't know if he understood. And he just, the only thing he muttered was, this is so hard. This is so hard. And I said, I know, but you're going to eat your meal. I just had mine. I'm going to sit here with you and then we're going to start together and you're going to be fine. And, and that's, and that's what we did. Yeah. Right. And he was like, I mean, he wasn't, he hadn't lost his mind, but he was hurting and we still have a long way to go still. Yeah. And it's in the middle yeah. of the night. Yeah. And, uh, so we, then we left and when I got down to Valaine was the next control the person that I had been riding with that's behind me said the control is closed. You're screwed. You're not. You're, he said the control is closed. And I said, well, that's, I mean, it's fine. I'm going to finish. My goal was not necessarily to, you know, I would love to make 84 hours, but I'm just going to, I'm going to finish it and I'm not going to finish it if there's no food and I got to come back up this hill. So I know where yeah. I need to be. He said the control's closed. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to go and, and lay down and get some, get and sleep. I'm going to sleep for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And he said, well, the control is closed. Why don't you come with me? And I said, no, <laughs> you're not helping me anyway. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, he went on and then I went into the control and the control was not closed. The control was open. <laughs> and I think he just wanted me to <laughs> drag him around, <laughs> drag him around. I don't know. It was the only, it was the only not super awesome experience that I had. Yeah. And it's so crazy. I got my, got my thing stamped and I was like, I, there were some other people there. I was like, I know I'm tired, but you just heard what I just heard. There were some San Francisco guys there. And he goes, yeah, he said it was closed. It was not closed. I was like, all right. Maybe he was dreaming. Because somebody else later at another, at, I think even our last control, or control before last, was devastated, sitting there, losing his mind because the control is closed. And we're like, it's not closed. It's right there. It's open. He goes, no, it's not. We're like, it <laughs> is right there. It's open. He goes, he goes, no, I DNF. I'm not finishing because it's closed. And we're like, it's not closed. It's right. That's it's right where the lights are. He goes, what? And it's, and then he started muttering a bunch of stuff that made zero sense. Uh, and so I got some sleep, like uh, 20 minutes, and I woke back up. And one thing somebody had told me before you, before we even started any of this, was your body and I said, I don't know if I can sleep in the grass or sleep in the day. And they said, your body will put you to sleep. You will go to bed and your body will put you there. And they were right. Like you can go to sleep anywhere in the grass and rocks. I have a picture of one guy literally sleeping down the stairs. Like his feet are on 
three stairs away from his head. And it can't, <laughs> it can't be comfortable. <laughs> but he's sleeping. He's just asleep. And so I slept. I woke up and there were uh, four uh, SFR guys that were about to take off. Uh, it was uh, Ed, Misha, um, Matt, and then one and then one other San Francisco randonneur guy. And I was like, you want to ride together? And we still had maybe 200 miles to go and, or two, maybe, maybe even a little more than 200. That's so crazy. Like I can't even get my head around like being that, you know, in the pain locker and then, and then knowing, like, knowing you, you have 200 miles to go. Think, we don't think, we don't ever talk about like, Oh, we only have 600 more miles to go. We have more yeah. miles to yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. We, we just have, have to get we have to get to the next control. Yeah. We just got to get to the next control. Yeah. And we rode together through the night uh and it was awesome. It was one of my best night rides ever that of uh emotionally that I've ever had. That it was awesome. We were making good time. It was a beautiful night. We're all laughing, having a um a good time. We're all uh fed and we all have fluids and making stops where we need to stop and get a sausage or a coffee or whatever. And it was awesome. Um, and then we got to two controls to go and there was a storm coming in behind us and I'm showing them on the radar. Like this is coming. It's really thin. It's going to like, it's going to blanket us with water and lightning for like 15 minutes. So let's get under that tent and go to sleep for 15 minutes. And they said, no, I was like, well, I think we should stay dry. I think it's important because if you get wet after, you know, you're going to get blisters. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Things are going to start rubbing you in the wrong places. Like you could have a whole host of new problems because you're wet and it hasn't rained yet. Yeah. And so then they, we traded, like we compromised. Uh, Ed was the, was, um, uh, did the most compromise he said all right i'm gonna go get a sandwich and a coke you sleep i'll wake you up in 15 minutes and if it's not raining we're leaving and i was like done so he did that uh and matt and misha were all we were still all there together and uh they were stronger riders than me so i need them so he kicked me to wake me up and i was like let's go and uh it kept getting then it got light maybe two or three two hours later so and, the the rainstorm did it materialize no, it didn't rain. <laughs> <laughs> I told him it was going to rain and showed them the radar probably for 45 minutes. I was like, I was on the ridge. I came down. They're stronger than me, so they finished before me. I was like, I was on the ridge by myself. The rainstorm is right behind us. Like I'm watching the lightning storm roll in. Right. And the lightning storm went around us like that. And so, it sounds like you just convinced these guys you needed a 15-minute I need 15 nap. minutes, yeah. <laughs> but they were, they were cool with it, and we all left together. Uh... And we met up with another SFR guy named Noah, who's a really strong rider. And we were rocking through the middle of morning, having a great time. Was this the most simpatico group you ever found yeah, throughout the time? For sure. Yeah. yeah, without them, I wouldn't have finished. Like if it hadn't been if it hadn't been for them and their enthusiasm to finish, um, like Ed had done it twelve years ago and didn't finish. Uh, it was Misha's first time. It may have been, I don't remember about Matt. Um, but they had a lot of energy and enthusiasm and like, Hey, let's all, we, we're better off together than we are separately. So let's figure out a way to do this together. Yeah. Even though Misha was so fast and he was in like Tiva clip ins, he was so fast. We would all start together and he would take off and we just wouldn't see him again to the next control. We'd catch up at the control or stop. And then we would all leave together and he would <laughs> <laughs> he would take, he's like, I'm just riding my pace, but he was, uh, had a great attitude. Uh, and then maybe, maybe four, four or five hours before the finish, it started raining. And then the rain, if it had rained two days earlier, it would have been a different ball game, but yeah. because, you know, you can you kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, you, uh, you're motivated and they, they had stopped for coffee, so I went on, and they're faster, so I figured they would uh, catch up with me at some point. And then I rode with, uh, I rode with one gentleman from um, Thailand and one from Indonesia for a while that I think they'd kind of lost hope a little bit. They were, uh, they'd missed their cutoffs by a ways. We saw people and were talking to people that had their, their deadline, their like time to finish is literally within an hour. And we're hundred miles away 
And they all they could talk about is I have to get there, I have to get there. I'm like, you, yeah, just slow down. You're not making any sense. You're all over the road. People were in the last twelve hours before the finish. People are not making any sense. People are not speaking in complete sentences. People that clearly speak English are not speaking <laughs> not speaking <laughs> English. They're making up things in their head and telling you about them like they're real. And all they said the only the only cohesive uh, sentiment with all of those people is I'm going to finish. I'm going to like, even no matter what they're talking about, rainbows and unicorns or shiny pennies or whatever they got going on in their brain, that's not working out because they need some rhodiola probably. (laughs) They consistently say this. One guy said, this is the, this is the time. This is the year. He said in like kind of French English, this is the year I'll finish. Yeah. This is the year. Like, like he had done this several other times and yeah. had not finished. And he was probably 15 years older than me. I'm 51. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting. I mean, you and I talked about this a little bit on a bike ride one day, just like even with Ironmans and different things that we've done, I've always known the finish line was there and within my capabilities, mm-hmm. but 1200 kilometers in that time frame. So much can go wrong, whether it's physically, mentally, mechanically. So much can go wrong. Yeah. Like just, and some yeah. things just are beyond your control and yeah. it's unfortunate. Uh, and it's, it's, there are so many opportunities for something to go catastrophically wrong or just to eat up so much time. You're like, I've spent six hours on the side of the road trying to fix this problem and it's not fixed. Yeah. And now I'm exhausted from trying to fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't made it a single additional mile. Yeah. None of that ever happened to me. It does happen. Like yeah. I did see people that happen. We had the event um, in the end had about a 40% DNF rate, which is they had 4,800 finishers out of 8,000. Okay. And um, was that because it was hot this year or is that pretty average? I think that's even higher than average. I okay. think the average is like 33 or 35. I, it depends on where you're from. Some people dropped out because it was hot. It was like maybe 90 the first day. Maybe maybe a little more than that, 90 Fahrenheit. And one guy I talked to after the race was over, he said, I dropped out because it was too cold. <laughs> <laughs> he was 80, right. one, right. and from Thailand. <laughs> and so he's, you know, it needs to be 90 for him to ride comfortably. Right. Not, right. not 80. Yeah. And he said it was too cold. It was way too cold. And then he just dropped out. So you didn't have any mechanical mishaps. Nope. You, you largely, you know, you... you you found yourself in the hurt locker physically at certain points, but you kind of just did what you need to do, right? Mm-hmm. You, you don't know exactly what the answer is. You, don't know, but you, you just know you, don't go fast. And hydrate. There's and no eat. reason to go fast. And you can't ride if you don't drink. Yeah. Right. So you didn't, you're, you're sort of now within 50 miles of the finish line. And you, yeah. you did mention we, to me you had some, some issues. We had some, yeah. So uh, I, I sent you a text at one point said, I, I think I just sent it to you. I was like, I'm and my wife. I'm like, I'm pulling out. Yeah. Like back uh, right yeah. after breast. And then we rocked through the night. I mean, we, we slept for the last 37 hours. I slept maybe an hour and moved a lot. Like there was not yeah. a lot of sit down and we were working together well and doing it the way you're supposed to be doing it. And having like these really great feelings of camaraderie and, and even though it's a self-reliance, like you're doing it with the friendship and camaraderie of others that are like-minded and close to the same uh, physical capability. And it was awesome. And so I got to the last control in Drew and I was like, I have three hours left. I know it's only 30 K it's like, or maybe a little more, maybe like 24 miles. I have three yeah. hours. I'm going to, I'm like, I was elated. We had worked really hard to get there and had pushed for 37 hours almost almost on the bike the whole time and so i texted everybody i knew basically i was like i'm gonna make it i can't believe it like my brain is coming back together it's not in the middle of the night you're thinking all this weird stuff and I'm, i know what's going on i'm uh i'm helping out with these these two guys that i've been riding with and had been raining for a couple of hours but it's only 24 miles so i sat down had a meal which was awesome and uh, the two guys I was riding with, only one of them wanted to continue. They both missed their time cuts already. And so one of them was going to sleep. Uh, and I'd had a flat repaired. 
they had a mechanic station there and I'd been riding a probably 10 pound flat for 10 miles because <clears throat> I didn't want to stop and do it in the rain. You got to get it all out. And it's like, it would have taken forever. And I was hoping that there would be a, a, a shop there. And so we left. And when I got my bike from the, from the shop, my Garmin's not, not working. It just wants me to delete everything. And I just turn it on, turn it off, turn it on, turn it off. It's like, I don't know. It's, I've been following signs. There are signs that say either yeah. Brest or Paris the whole way. There's probably 20,000 signs yeah. on the route. Were like, you try? were you, I'm just curious about this little detail. It may seem super minute, but how were you trying to keep your electronics powered along the way? I had batteries. Okay. So I had, a, like- I had a battery, I had two solar chargers that were battery packs just in case. Like I kind of did it the wrong way. I had three lights of just the, the little tr- trail. I forgot the name of the brand, but it's a mountain bike light yeah. that lasts about four hours on low. So I had three of those just in case, because if you don't have, if one of your lights goes out and you get stopped by control, you have to wait for it to charge before you can. Because it's it. illegal to ride in it's France. Illi- that's right. Right. Okay. And on the on this ride in particular, you can't ride without without a tail light and a headlight yeah. and and um, reflective gear. And so I had three tail lights, three headlights, two big battery packs. So my bike probably weighed 15 pounds too much, and uh, so everything you know is staying charged i've got the garmin charge i have a watch charge most of it it kind of messed up one day and so we leave and it's not working and i said all right well it's not i can't get this right and so you just follow the signs i've been following yeah. signs literally I, I could have done it without a garmin without directions at all until that point yeah and uh we had been warned that people will steal the signs okay <clears throat> that as a souvenir so you get a sign they give you one of the signs when you when you pick up your just in the hopes when you to pick up your avoid, avoid people yeah. stealing them because then they yeah. will steal them all in the same place right next to the end right right because that's that where sense. they all yeah. are they're yeah. done they go back on the course and they grab one and so when i'm riding with a uh a gentleman from thailand and we're following uh a man from france i don't know where he's from in france but he didn't speak any english and so we're following signs following signs and all of a sudden there's no more signs so it's me the guy from Thailand, the guy from France, and two people from Germany, a husband-wife team. We realized nobody knows where they're going. Nobody's electronics are working. There's no, I see zero signs, and you're just in farmland. And we're like, all right, well, how do we get back to there? So we started, all of us started going to a, in a direction of a, that we thought, and we got up there, and it's not, it's not the right way. There's no sign. So we realized we're lost. And the gentleman that we were following, because I'm just following, so you've been doing it for, you know, yeah. 650 miles, long, almost 700 miles. I'm following the guy in front of me. And then the people he's following, because he doesn't have electronics, the woman, uh, it was a husband-wife team, the woman has Shermer's neck, which I'd never heard of until you know, two months ago or three months ago. Yeah, what the heck is that? And I've never seen it. So at the very end, I saw maybe a dozen people with it. And it's where it's a condition that you can't hold your head up anymore. So your neck muscles are shot and they're not firing. And all you look at, if you're on the bike, all you're looking at is your pedals. You can't even pick your head up to look past the handlebars. You can see, Jeez. you can see your pedals, your handlebar and your wheel, but you don't know where you're going. So if you have to take yeah. a right turn, you can't do it. She is holding her head up with her fist under her chin. That's incredible. And her husband is giving her directions from behind her. A little to the right. A little to the left. Because you can't really... I mean, she's been awake for, you know, three and a half days. And so we're like, we're following the people with Shermer's neck. And nobody has electronics. And there's no signs. We don't know where we are. (laughs) We don't know where we are. I can't even imagine how demoralizing that would be. It was pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any... I go... uh, I cannot get anything on my Garmin to work at all. And it probably it's from, it, like right now, if I were in the same condition, I would say, oh, you do this and this and this. And like logic's kind of gone out the window. I think we're going to miss the, we're going to miss the cutoff. Yeah. I look to see how far the, the, the start and finish town is Rambouillet. And I look to see how far Rambouillet is. And it's, I only had 24 miles from Drew to Rambouillet. Well, now it's like 27 miles. And I'm like, oh, by, by like Apple Maps. Yeah. And I said, I'm just going to ride back. I don't know what you guys are doing. The Shermer's neck and husband, they left. 
going in one direction. And we're not going that way. Because it's not the direction of the finish town. I don't know where they're going. So we rode back to where we think we got lost. And we're riding around. The guy that only speaks French is trying to get his Garmin to work. We're all worried because he and I are in the same group. We're both about to miss cutoff. The other guy uh, from Thailand had already missed it. And I got on my on my phone just directions back to back to the start finish line. I was like, I'm just going to follow this. I said, this is what I point to the guy from France. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. You can come with me if you want. And he said, no. He said, come with me. <laughs> come with me. <laughs> I said, but this gets me there. And this has me getting there 15 minutes late. But I know, you know, it's, it's doing it from a, from a bicyclist perspective. And I can probably go faster than that. Has me there 15 minutes late. But also it has like seven, you know, construction zone things going on. I'm like, this is, I can't believe I've worked all this all for the last three days and qualification and giving up time with my family. It was kind enough to let me do all this. And I screwed it up in the last like 20 miles. Yeah. And I'm going to miss it. I'm going to finish, but I'm, I am, I'm so close to, to completing it in the cutoff time. Yeah. So we're panicked. And he said, no, he's motioning. Just follow me. Just follow me. So he literally starts going down a pedestrian path that no bikes are allowed on or cars because it's, it's like sidewalk going through fields going in the opposite direction of the finish town and i see it on my phone like we're going the wrong way and he's like just follow me and so i'm, I'm like all right do i go with apple maps but i don't try <laughs> i don't trust for many reasons or do i follow this frenchman who is pretty emphatically saying follow me i i know where we are and so I followed him, and we went maybe two or two and a half miles on pedestrian paths where Apple saying, like, you can't be on this path. And then we're still going to get there late, according to Apple. We're still going to get there late. We're still going to get there late. And then finally, we pop out on this road, and I see other cyclists. So we're back on the path. And so, okay, yeah. so we're back on the path. But Apple says, I'm going to miss my miss my time cut by 15 minutes still. And so we're right, and I'm like, now I now I see riders and I just get I say look I can pull us just get on my wheel just sit on me and we'll go as fast as we can we'll go as hard as we can until one of us passes out and he ends up dropping off and I take off and then the path it still says I'm gonna miss it I'm gonna I've been riding for 20 minutes it still says I'm gonna miss it and then the path that we're on goes up a one-way street the wrong way which Apple Maps won't let you do. And so as soon as I get to the other side of that, it drops it by 30 minutes. It's incredible. <laughs> and I'm going as hard. I'm like, I'm head down, going as hard as I can without blowing up everything I got until that point. And I realized, like, I realized what has just happened. And now I'm going to get there 30 minutes ahead of time. <laughs> and I breathe, a, breathe for a second and still going hard. And finally, I, I catch up with these uh these guys that are SFR um, riders, and I'm just like, I'm about to fall over. Like, can I just sit on your wheel? And they let me sit on their wheel. It was yeah. Hans and another gentleman, and I sat on their wheel till the finish line. And, and got there in I was time. Bare. And then I'm super worried about the Frenchman, who if it weren't for him, I'd be on a highway somewhere trying to get back to the start line yeah. following Apple Maps. Uh, and if it weren't for him, and it, he's in the same cutoff as me, so... I did see him uh, after he finished and he made the cutoff and we had a, Great. we had a tearful embrace and it was, I was terrified I was going to miss it and I have all these emotions and like I was totally fine emotionally until I can even see the finish line. I'm like, there it is. Like, let's just, let's just go to it. And then I got to the finish line and lost it and burst into tears. And my yeah. friend Ray is there and he's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Cause he, he finished. He finished in in eighty hours, I think. Okay. Like he finished really fast. No, he finished in uh, seventy four hours, I think. Pretty fast. Yeah. And so he had been there and gotten a night's sleep, and uh, and I was just a mess. <laughs> and I've never been like that in a, maybe yeah. my first Ironman ever because I was you know I'd built it up in my brain that it yeah. was going to be like this yeah. huge accomplishment, and it's... and it was it was. It was incredibly emotional. Yeah, understandably so. I mean, yeah. everything you went through to get there, to arrive in France in the first place, and then certainly everything you went through 
over the course of those 84 hours. Yeah. Like to finally like not have to stress to you, not have you, to, yeah, 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 pressure on you to like keep going and keep yeah. finishing and yeah. just where you can like, you didn't need to do anything. You didn't it's need done. To, yeah. It's done. Throw the bike down. Pass like, out. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. And I made it, uh, I did an 83, 83, 25, I think. So okay. I had 35, 35 minutes yeah. to spare. Uh, so it was, cl- it was close. Yeah. Especially considering an hour before that, yeah. I was not going to make it. And yeah. The, and the time cut off at all. Do you get the sense from some of the, your other riders that you knew, like Ray, like, did they get involved with groups that were like moving together throughout the entire course? Or? Ray did for sure, because he left at 90 hours and he said he, he had, they had really good groups taking turns. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, that's, I mean, that's a good way to go. That's yeah. a, you know, it's definitely is, uh, get you going faster with less effort. Um, there were, there were large groups, probably, probably a lot of large groups from the 90 hour group. Uh, and then our group, I never really saw time. I would see there were uh, at, a, at the occasional control or we'd leave an, even a, just a, a sandwich shop or something. People would say, all right, I'm going to go. And then two minutes later, somebody else would leave. And then 30 seconds later, somebody else would leave. And 30 seconds behind someone is no benefit. Yeah. So we would have to say, stop. Like, let's all leave in two minutes. And there'll be five of us together instead of five individuals yeah. spread apart. And some people, I think, just want to do it on their own, and that's just where their where their mind is and where their like kind of their game plan is. I'm going to do it on my own. Like, okay, uh, yeah. but I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> I need to ride somebody else. <laughs> uh, and they were. Uh, I did hear. I heard stories. Uh, I heard. I heard story of one person that had Shermer's neck that put screws into her helmet and then taped taped the screws and then taped the tape back to the back of her oh bag in the back to hold her head up so she could see. And then one gentleman I had breakfast with the next day from, uh, he was Irish. He had, he had a not terrible case of it, but pretty bad. I mean, bad enough that he said he had to, he stacked all of his spacers onto his head tube to raise his arms up so he could raise up <laughs> enough to see it's not the right position and he said at one point he was looking at his fork and he said he looked at it for two hours in the mm-hmm. middle of the night he said that's not my fork that's <laughs> not somebody got somebody while i was sleeping came in here while i was eating came in here and changed my fork to this fork that's not my fork who would have done that gone through all that trouble that's a lot of effort <laughs> to change take my fork and give me this other fork I said, how'd you, what'd you do? And he goes, I had to go back through pictures and find a picture of me standing next to my bike with that fork to convince myself like, oh, I'm just not in the right place mentally to make decisions like this, you know, magical fork theft. Oh, man. And uh, so stories like that I heard a lot of the next day and a lot of Shermer's Neck stories of people that can't hold their head up. And yeah, and uh, you could see. I didn't see any of I didn't see any of this, but I did get told people would come to the finish line and it changes pavement. It goes from hard packed gravel to cobbles for thirty feet maybe to to loose gravel dirt in uh maybe two hundred meters before the finish line. It changes three different pavements. And people would see the finish line and raise their arms and <laughs> celebration immediately fall to the ground <laughs> because they have no control right. over anything they have you know something that muscles aren't working on them or they try to raise their arm and Ray said they would just see them like fall over and people then they they've now crashed you know 25 feet from the finish line <laughs> from no from no reason other than celebrating that they're excited right. and they they don't realize things don't work anymore. yeah like muscles don't yeah. work their neck doesn't work their arm, shoulders are all pinched and locked up and he said people are just falling over like oh, oh, person after person after person celebrating and they just <laughs> crash and they'd have to go pick them up and then Drag i can't them. imagine a kind of a worse way to <laughs> worse way to end your 90 hour yeah. Uh, bicycle ride and crashing in the gravel and getting a bunch of rocks under your 100%. skin. hundred percent. So what do you, what do you do after finishing? You just go and crash somewhere and sleep for a day? Yeah. Uh, I didn't have a plan because I didn't know, I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, I did have a vehicle there. Uh, uh, so I went and stayed in the barracks. So they just open up a big room basically and, 
in one of the buildings and throw cots in there. Okay. I have cots and like an emergency blanket. And I bought some, uh, I didn't chat. I, I didn't, I wasn't really thinking right. I ordered a pizza, but I don't think I ever went to pick it up. No, I went to go get a change my mind to a steak. <laughs> and uh, so I got some bottles of Evian, rinsed off, and went and laid down. And then people, I went to bed at maybe 10 at night after having gotten there at 5 or you know just before 5 in the evening. And <clears throat> there were people that kept coming in for the next, I was there 12 hours maybe. I left at maybe 10 in the morning. And people kept coming in. You could hear them like shuffling yeah. around, like, falling over cots and like they've been out there for, at this point, like four days. Yeah. And, uh, or maybe even longer. It depends on when they, depends on when they left. And because if you are, it's an out and back. So if you're 50 miles from the finish and you want to call it quits, there's nobody to call it quits to. There's not a control there. There's nothing there. You just need to ride, ride on in. Yeah. And, and they kind of got, I think they were in probably pretty bad condition. Yeah. I slept, slept well, and then I went and had more food. I've been, I'm still eating, I'm still catching up on food and probably not fluids, but on, on food. Yeah. Um, that it, it just takes a lot of time to put it back in you to gain your weight back. Such an incredible experience and accomplishment. Having done lots of big events, your mm-hmm. Ironmans, your Leadvilles, where does Perry Breast Paris fit into the... It's pretty high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I didn't think that at the beginning... And then I told, it may have been you that I told, like the kind of the further I get away from that event, um, the more special it is becoming to me in my brain. Like remembering all of, I probably have a, I probably have a solid year's worth of riding stories yeah. in three days. Yeah. And some of them significant. Some of them were like a very low point for me or a very high point for me, or just seeing something that I've never, never seen. I've been cyclist my whole life since I was 12. I never seen Shermer's neck. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. And I saw a dozen of them, of people that I don't know. You know, there were people that were definitely being dangerous at the end, I'm but sure. they don't know they're being yeah, dangerous. Yeah. Like at one point, we had to tell one uh, one rider to get away from us. Like you were riding from the right line across the line to the left line on the other on oncoming traffic, and back. You, for every you know hundred meters, you're you're moving forward you probably did 300 meters of riding because you're just going back and forth and it's not a hill <laughs> it's flat <laughs> flat ish and it's dangerous and so they yeah. you know they kind of they need to be able to stop those but when do you stop how do you tell an official you don't i'm not stopping to tell anybody anything i'm going yeah like we're close i did hear of one gentleman that was that was just non-responsive 100 percent. he's standing there eyes open He's not saying a word, yeah. and he's just comatose. Yeah, and they pulled him. Yeah, is is what I heard, and that probably is happening because people are the people are just it's in their brains that they're going to go and get this thing done. Yeah, and, and they like I felt like I was really mentally prepared for it, and these people are way more mentally <laughs> prepared for it than I was because they they're just not going to stop to probably to the point of being dangerous. Yeah, but and, I mean, there's got to be a little bit of that in you, just inherently in signing up for something like this. You know, as you said before, you know it's possible. You've previewed in your mind the places you're going to need to go and the pain you're going to have. Yeah, and you've said to yourself unless it's going to hurt me physically or my family, I'm going to keep going. Like you, right. Yeah. You, you sort of yeah. like made those decisions. You make, you make the trade yeah. in your brains already uh, of what it is that you're willing to give up to get to the next control. Yeah. Are you, you going to do this? Yes or no. And if you get to a point then you know, the answer is no, because I don't want to, you know, be in the oncoming traffic. Yeah. Like if I were doing that, I'm like, all right, I'm going to finish, but I'm going to go to bed for until I wake up. I'm not going to set an alarm. I'm just going to go over to some grass somewhere and fall asleep. And and then you can come back and you can finish. You might not make your time, but you did it in a safer manner. Yeah. I definitely got the feeling that some people are not. They were. It's almost like the way that I <clears throat> have ever explained uh, uh, drinking alcohol to one of my kids. Like my kids are in young, young teens, so we talk about it. I'm like... Somebody like you would never have, like my son would never have 10 beers, 10. I mean, 10 a lot, but somebody with nine beers in him would, and it's not you anymore. Like you are not making that decision anymore. 
it's the person with nine in them that's making the decision, and you gave them authority to make that decision when you had eight and seven and six, and right, and back it on down. It's the exact same thing. That person, if I showed them a video of themselves right now, weaving all over the road, they would make the decision to lay down and go to sleep. Yeah. But it's not them making the decision anymore. It's them plus 680 miles or 700 miles or even further and, you know, three or four hours of sleep in four days with this tremendous physical exertion and this tremendous physical expense. Uh, so they're not making that decision anymore. It's whatever they have kind of predetermined in their mind is their break point. And their break point was pretty far. Yeah. But that said, I don't th- I think I-, I did read an article that said it was an unsafe event. Like they're all, you put 8,000 people on a bicycle all at the same time, something's going to happen. It's not going to be good. And that's just the law of probability. Like, I don't think anybody has died doing the ride. And maybe the last one was 2011 or something. And yeah, that's, I, that's not, that's not yeah. bad. It's not like people are dying on it all the time or even end up in the hospital, yeah. uh, to my knowledge. And for that reason, I think it's, you know, even though there are dangerous things that are happening, it seems to be like a pretty safe event. Well, you think about the equipment available, the nutrition, like all the stuff back in the 1890s when people were doing it. It's, it's that's one of the things that draws me to it, to that specific event. Like I feel, I feel accomplished as a rider for having done it and having gone through some peaks and valleys and a couple of significant valleys for me. Like, I feel that makes you feel accomplished. If it was just easy peasy and I sat on somebody's wheel for 760 miles, like, I'd probably still feel accomplished, actually. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, should. That's a long way. <laughs> but doing it on a what is lo- probably a 40 pound bicycle, probably with solid, probably, probably more than that, it's the same amount of climbing that they did. It's about 40,000 feet. Yeah. Uh, with whatever they had available to them and whatever, I mean, I've got heart rate and Garmin and I know the, I know, I see what is coming. I see the hills that are coming up through technology. I've got a relatively light bike that is, you know, probably one of the, it's probably a fantastic bike for this particular event. Packs, rain gear, technical gear, super stiff shoes. You all your bag of I've got, modern medicine. I've got everything. A big, big top tube filled with rhodiola and, and salt tabs and like, I, like all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I can't imagine having done something like that 130 years ago and, and, and finishing. Yeah. It's unbelievable to me that, I mean, people had some grit to be able to, to do that. Like, what distance or what level of complication or elevation would you have to accomplish now for it to be equated to that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't but know. it's definitely further with a lot more climbing. Yeah, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> definitely. Yeah, to, to to match the same yeah. tenacity that they had to go and yeah and say I'm going to go do that. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's just like everything. It happening every four years. Yeah the sheer challenge of what you undertook. It's just amazing. Congrats for making it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It was, it was, it was awesome. I would love to go back and do it again with friends. Uh, as you and I talked about, it's a difficult, it's a difficult event to do with a friend, I think. Yeah. Because at some point, if you're one mile an hour off of the other one, you guys, you have to split up and go on your own. Um, and for, and that's the only reason it would be, it'd be difficult. It'd be fun to do the brevets together. It'd be fun to do the training together and be fun to make an adventure out of it together. Uh, and be, you know, as partnered up as you can, just like a cycling race. And then when it comes time to like, Hey, this is not working out for one of us. The other one has to understand. Yeah. No, I think you, you just, you have your own journeys in these events. It's your own. Whether it's these big gravel events or Perry breast Paris, it's just like, hopefully, I mean, I think that's the beauty of it, right? You, you get to the finish line You've all gone through your stuff, whatever your own, that stuff was, right. but you were out there together. You saw the same things and you come back and you can revel in that shared experience, even though you weren't riding side. Yeah. Side. Like the guys that I rode with the last day, basically, if I saw them right now, I might give them a big hug and I, and I barely know them. 
but we did that thing we did that yeah. together especially at the end and uh and have that shared experience and can l- laugh about it and they all have their own lives to get by it's not what they do for a living yeah you know it's a it is a it's a hobby it's a it's a good hobby it's a athletic it will help you live longer uh but in the end it's just a it's a it's something yeah. you're doing for yourself as much as i tell my kids i'm doing it for them <laughs> i want to be around to help you guys later the way i'm going to be around yeah. is stay fit amazing yeah thanks for sharing the story I'm thank sure you for you having yeah. me craig it's okay. craig and i've been friends for 20 ish years mm-hmm. and uh and it's i'm super uh happy and and really honored to be on your podcast I yeah. know a lot of people follow you mm-hmm. and uh like even when craig and i've been in different areas of the world people have said are you craig Dal- <laughs> are you craig dalton <laughs> you have your buy your gravel ride jersey on and they're like do you know craig dalton and one time you had to say I am Greg Dalton. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, hey. it's uh, so it's it's fun to be you know, a part of that. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. You're welcome. I appreciate having you. Um, I was stoked to document some of this journey because I want your kids and family to listen to it and hear yeah. all your stories and all of our friends and hopefully everybody else out there will check out Perry Breast Paris. There's a lot written about it. There's a lot of resources mm-hmm. and you can see the journey that many people went on this year in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Gravel Ride Podcast. Big thanks to James for coming on and telling us all about Perry Breast Paris. I hope, like me, you enjoyed learning a little bit more about the sport of randonneering and such a storied event they have there in France. I forget if we mentioned it during the show, but it only happens every four years. So it's such a big deal to arrive at the start line and get to the finish line. It's definitely one of those bucket list events. I was thrilled to get James on the microphone to talk about it as I wanted to document his experiences so he could share it with his family first and foremost, but also to all of you. If you're able to support the podcast, please visit buymeacoffee.com slash the gravel ride or ratings and reviews are hugely appreciated. Until next time, here's to finding some dirt under your wheels.